There are well-known problems with farmland. Farmland birds are in decline, many farmland species are in decline. And yet, obviously, we need food. So what's the compromise here? So I'm here at Great Farm in Holcomb with Jake Fines. Jake Fines wrote the um, classic book, Land Healer. I've got a well-thumbed copy. So, um, so tell me, Jake, I can see there's a, a field here. What's happened at this field here? So this is a classic North Norfolk uh, traditional farming field. So it farms cereals, but also root crops. And when we took the farm on from a tenant uh, we took the opportunity to use this as a test bed where we could uh, look at being uh, more imaginative and progressive in the way we produce food and uh, uh, improving soil health and soil quality but also uh, looking at how we could make more space for nature and improve biodiversity within the farm. So we took it on and the first thing and the most important thing that we did was we baselined it. So we got an indication of where it was, what it was delivering on and what, was it, what it was failing on. Um, we then looked at the 10 fields of Great Farm and we said, how can we make those efficient for our food production? That was our primary goal in, initially. So we have a sprayer that's worth a quarter of a million pounds that has a 36 metre boom and we need that piece of machinery running in the field 100% of the time. So we changed the design of the field within the field to accommodate that piece of machinery. So that's efficient farming. So we farm the farm in uh, nine days initially to now farm it in six. So, so it's a very precisely measured rectangle that's the exact size of your equipment. So the key is don't get the director of conservation to design the field, get the spray operator to design the field. <laughs> so using GPS, he designed the fields. And that then gave me areas of land around each field to make space for nature. So the priority, uh, the, the most important natural capital element within this farm for nature was the hedges. The hedges had had historic management of being cut annually, relatively short. So we ceased hedgerow management in its entirety. We will at some point come to reinvigorate the hedges, but after six years, they're now just starting to deliver for a wide range of species. And they, they, look, they look splendid and they look nice and wide and they um, uh, obviously have a greater, much greater diversity than they did. So what, what, we've, what we've seen is we've seen some species within the farmland bird index like yellowhammer and lesser whitethroat find the hedges attractive. Let the yellowhammer require a singing post of at least 12 feet high, so we see greater territories of yellowhammer. Your lesser whitethroat require dense cover close to the base of the hedge, so we now have that with brambles, so we see an increase in... We see, uh, we then, adjacent to every, to buffer it from any uh, plant protection products or insecticides or herbicides, we buffer every single hedge with a six meter species rich flower meadow. And we talk about a flower or a hay meadow because it's agricultural terms. And that gives those within agriculture confidence that we're not removing agriculture from the processes we want to implement. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And we know we've lost 97% of our hay meadows. So can we recreate them? Of course we can. So we design a species mix that is going to thrive and succeed in this sort of soil type. So this is sandy loam over clay and it's very light. Um, so we choose species that will, will, will survive drought conditions. We then see other species like the wild mignonette come in and we see the wild marjoram and the um, viper's bugloss and small bugloss start to come in. And those aren't species that aren't part of the species mix, but they're species that already sit within the seed bank and will benefit from our management. So we then thereby increase the diversity within the sward. And if we've got diverse sward, we have a diverse range of inverts. Another practice. So then adjacent to that, on this soil type, polygonums, uh, annual, annual plants, arable weeds, whatever, whatever you want to call them. This soil type does annual weeds like you would never believe. <laughs> it, just, it, it excels yeah, in the yeah. production of annual weeds. Light chalky soil is perfect. So we, um, so adjacent to every 
hay meadow, linear hay meadow, we create a cultivated area. And we know the science tells us that cultivated areas, early succession processes in nature can be some of the richest and most diverse. And we, um, we put these in because A, they look nice and they deliver for nature, but it's also creating heterogeneity within a very small area. So hedgerow, track, hay meadow, cultivated. Cultivated, again, it's a farming term. So farmers are relaxed with mm -hmm. the language that we're using. But if you look at this, this cultivated strips, they're, they're very different. I can see there's different patches. What's been going on there? So the, um, the cultivated area, the six metre adjacent to the crop, um, we know through, uh, through science, but we also with, le with learning and anecdotal of, of wh what we can do and where we can create, a, create greater species abundance, that if we cultivate at different times of year and at different depths, we can create a range of species. So this year, we have done a series of interventions to look at the impacts that we have. And what you can see is, that, so we cultivated in the autumn, we cultivated the entire area in the autumn. We then got an influx of brome in places, uh, and brome is an issue for many arable farmers because it can have quite a detrimental impact on their, on their food crops. So we took the decision where there was high densities of brome, we would spray glyphosate. Now by spraying the glyphosate, we remove all the plants we want. So we then recultivate in the spring. In the process of the operator spraying off, he was asked just where he saw dense vegetation, dense areas of brome, and then when he cultivated, tried to cultivate the areas he thought he had sprayed off, but if he missed it, it didn't matter. So we create these, with a range of uh, uh, interventions, we create a diversity within the cultivated area. We have heavy flowering of the autumn areas um, in so, June. So just to clarify, there's as well as you described that spraying that took place, you divided this area up with different treatments and cultivated in different ways and sprayed in different Precisely. ways. So Precisely. So you're le you are learning from the different treatments. And we're, we're learning. So, so some of the rarer arable plants, so uh, night flowering catchfly uh, um, and rough poppy, we see those benefiting and seeing a greater abundance of those in the autumn cultivation. We see the areas that are cultivated in the spring having less diversity, but they're flowering later. So we then get a prolonged flowering season, which then has a knock-on benefit for all of the invertebrates that we're trying to encourage. So, so it seems that the success of this scheme is that you're, you're, you're concentrating your farming and you're making sure it's very efficient by uh, getting the fields of the right sizes and that then you're taking areas out of production, but you're learning all the time. You're experimenting and testing and finding better ways of doing things. And that seems to me a, a very powerful combination. So, so what do you see as the vision of farming in the future? What's, what I, would you I like think to see? every farm has a responsibility to make space for nature. Some will make more space than others. Some will prioritize their food production. But when we come out of a policy that said grow food anywhere, some of the areas we were growing food didn't produce food at economic levels. Mm -hmm. And those are the obvious areas to make space for nature. Um, it's, and all of us, all, all landowners, land managers need to identify what their priority is. And some will prioritise nature, and some will prioritise nature with food, and some will prioritise food. And it's this range of approaches that will make the British landscape more rich and vibrant because it's, it's not a one-size-fits-all system. It's about a range of applications in a range of uh, areas to provide multiple outcomes. Now, as I understand it, your yields are the same as they used to be and you're, you're, you've got lots of evidence because you did baseline to show that your species have increased. So there hasn't been an impact of yields, but as we collect the yield data over time, by taking out the less productive areas, we see our average yield increase. Because if you have half a hectare in a 10 hectare field that is 60% less productive than the rest of the field, that impacts the yield on the whole field. Mm -hmm. And it's trying to explain that, that actually we're increasing yields rather than depleting them. So, uh, so what do you see as the vision of the future? What would you like, what would you like governments to do?
I would like governments to incentivise this process, ask farmers to report on them so we can have a real understanding where we use, we are science led on the ecology front. We already have lots of data and science on food growing. How can we get science to provide the correct advice for the right application in the right place for the right outcomes? Brilliant. Thank you.